today the first part of my interview with Palestinian Australian Abdul Rahmahi, in which he talks about his childhood in Palestine prior to the establishment of the State of Israel, being forced from the family home and village to find refuge near Ramallah, and later to the Soviet Union to study, and finally settling in Australia. Abdul begins his story. I was born in a village east of Tel Aviv, nowadays Tel Aviv, uh, 1938, just before Israel was created by 10 years. What I witnessed, my memory goes just as far as I remember, that uh, we have neighbor Jews, which was separated from us by a road. So west of the road was a settlement, and east of the road, our property, which was uh, Orange Orchard, where we lived in that time. Uh, We have friends of uh, these old uh, settlers who were probably originally from Yemen. They were very kind people. One of them was his name Shimon, and the other was uh, Friedman. Started, uh, what I remember in that time, it was... uh, uh, end of the uh, the Second World War, really. We used to see the British Army tanks passing around. The Jewish settlers, until uh, until the end of the war, it wasn't noticed any activity, bad activity from them, really. Did the British interfere with life at all for you and your family? In that time, really, no. Until the Second World War, to the end of the Second World War, there was no interference. But uh, probably they were in that time preparing uh, this Jewish organization like Haganah and Ishtern and Argon, armed them, organized them, and trained them very well. Palestinian, probably we have started uprising 1936 to 1939 when people noticed that settlers' colonies started to take our land. They were protesting against that. England, until that time, they were really helping Israel, uh, the Jewish, because Israel was not created anyway. Palestinians, when they started their uprising, England stood very hard against them, oppressed them. They were not allowed to have any weapons, any activity, even, uh, say, was difficult to have uh, knives or any, any sort of that. What I mean, it was everything organized by Britain because Palestine was under British mandate in that time. So they have the police, they have the army, they have everything. Palestinians, they have nothing. They encouraged Jewish immigration from Europe, especially after the war, because they want to compensate for them, for the Holocaust, Nazis' Holocaust, to give them land in Palestine on our account. When Palestinians, they have no part in any case, in any way, in the Holocaust. So we have to pay a price for something we didn't commit. So anyway, it started the problems and the United Nations started to play a role because uh, they want uh, England, uh, they reckon they cannot uh, stay there. They are under rebellions from the Jewish organization, from the Palestinian organization, and they want to go out. There is a point, they reckon, that the Jewish organization which they can control the country, which can do anything there and establish their government. United Nations uh, tried to make partition of Palestine, which is uh, not fair. They gave um, the Jewish population uh, 55% of Palestine. Truly, they reached about one-third by, by population, bolstered by the immigration from Europe, and which was encouraged by the British uh, mandate, really. Palestinians rejected it because uh, it is against uh, human laws, against our uh, international law. We are the owner of that country, really. Say, in the beginning of the century, there were less than probably 6% in all Palestine, really. 
did your family lose their property in oh, those years oh. before 48? Oh, all of our property, really. All of our property, we were expelled from that village. 1948, I think on the 14th of May. Where were you on that day? Do you remember that day? I remember because when the battling started, we left the part where we, live, where we lived near the Israeli settlement. We went to our original village about, say, maybe 12, 13 kilometers from east of Tel Aviv, but it was on the top of a hill, small hill, and we could see the plains under the hill, really, you see? So we saw, I was young, I was 10 years old, I was young, I saw tanks and uh, soldiers' carriers coming from the west, I didn't count them myself, but people, they counted them. They say 97 vehicle was coming from Israeli or from Jew- Jewish part. And these people, not against our village. Our village is 700 people, actually, but against all the front, against a, a, a Lod, a Lod, this is uh, where is the Ben-Gurion airport now, against some uh, village, Kula, Majd al-Sadiq, uh, Deir Tarif, all this. They were clever. They were attacking from three sides and let one side open so as the people run away. Really, they want the land without people. My village in that time, uh, they lost two. They were volunteers to defend the. There were seven people. They killed two. And uh, I remember that my brother, he was uh, just young, uh, newly married. He came with his bl- shirt, white shirt, blood on it. And we asked him what for, what was. They said, that person and that person, we know them now anyway. They were killed. And they covered them in the, like a tip, really, because they have no time to dig or anything. Before that... The Jewish settlers who came from Europe, they were very aggressive, very brutal, really. They killed uh, many people from our village before that day, really. They burned uh, our fields of uh, wheat in that time because it was summer in that time in the northern sphere. So they were trying to drive you out even at that time? Yes, they were scaring and they weren't uh, pressurizing us on everything. Near Tel Aviv, before that that day, many people, they were going to volunteer to help other villagers there who were attacked by Jewish settlers. Uh, What I remember too from our family, two people, they went there and we never saw their faces anyway. They are dead, they were arrested in that time, they died in, under torture or anything, we never heard about them. We lost from our village also, one was working in a uh, train station in Aludda, where is been called on airport. Also, he's very close relative for me, we never saw him. And uh, when we left, we ran away from the village, one lady, old lady, Actually, her grandson is here in Don Casa living. Because well, she was very ill, they put her on a donkey. Under her, probably one mat or two mats, like when we sleep on, you know? Because we have no beds, normal beds like now. Mattresses, but it is mat, we put it on the ground and we sleep. She was killed by a shell. And we ran away. I was going with my niece, actually. No one knows where my family is, actually. They put some uh, mats on the horse for us, and we were driving it, just pulling it. So who told you to go? You're only a child of 10. I was child, and she is child. My, my niece is my age, too. How we went, I don't know. First, Liban, its name, village. And I don't know, I tell you, under the village, just... How we sat there, how the uh, mats went down from the horse, I don't know. And we fell asleep because we were tired. It is about uh, probably seven kilometers from our village. And what did you see on the way? Do you remember? On the way, people running, just, you know, the queue, people, uh, everybody uh, have a a, a mattress, having uh, a blanket, having uh, anything, but not much because on the... Shouted really on their heads, some ladies, 
because we have no cars, and uh, even the way what we went, it is a uh, mountain route. Uh, anyway, we sat there, then uh, he was a friend of my dad. He used to come to our vi village, bringing us uh, olives and olive oil and fig trees, because we haven't fig fruits. And he used to take oranges from us, like mutual, you know. And he offered to host us in his uh, home. The home was an uh, old home, which was extra for them. He said, I'm not sure, six by six, seven by seven, but my family was too big. My dad, he has three wives, two of my brothers, they were married, and uh, children everywhere, and uh, I have even uh, nephews and nieces from my, for my brothers. And we lived in this room uh, like sardines, you know, like sardines you put one by one and all the sides, all the sides we were going like that. Three people on a mat and this uh, room was our kitchen. This is where we make pots. We have no toilets actually, you have to go out to the mountain or something, you see. So we lived in this place, uh, say, about uh, five years. Really. Were you safe there? Yeah, it is far away from Israel, this one. Whereabouts is it? Deir Ghassani. Yeah. It is near Ramallah, north of Ramallah. Why it is safe? Israel, they took, as I said, there's partition, United Nations partition. So Israel is stopped near where the United Nations stopped them. You see? Even the land which was there, ours, which is on the border, they didn't build anything there because they thought that we will take it. They took it and they stayed there, they bulldozed all our village, all Palestinian village, they bulldozed about uh, 418 village. Bulldozed, that's just destroyed them and they bulldozed them. When I went back to 1970 to see our village, it was just a flat. I have a little bit memory, really. I know uh, here it was uh, the school. Our house, it was to the uh, east of the school. Uh, there's uh, like, you see some stones from the foundation. Foundation down, but you see still something there. How many people do you believe died in your village? In our village, at least 11 people died. And our village, it is not the big village. It is about 700 people, really. In total, probably they expelled from Palestinians uh, about 720,000. They effectively, ethnically cleansed 77% of Palestine. So they took it for, for them and uh, they uh, destroyed 418 villages. They made a couple of uh, notorious massacres, really, which uh, frightened Palestinians. One of them, Deir Yassin, probably you heard about it. Deir Yassin, just probably they done it in, in, at the beginning to frighten Palestinians and to make them run for life. One of them, really, actually I remember that, Deir Yassin is far away from us, uh, just we heard about, I didn't see. I was in the village where we live, it is very high. This village is on the mountains, very high. From that part, probably you see, t you see the sea there. Really. Very far, it is 20 kilometers, but far away. There, I, one day I am out and I heard uh, explosions. And when I went back, it was about, I think, 8 o'clock in the, in the evening, but it was already dark. Night. Maybe it was winter uh, in that time, it was uh, just uh, night. I went back to my room where we lived. I, I told my family they didn't believe me. The next day, we found out they destroyed the village of Kibya, it is called, just east of Ben Gurion Airport. It was in the Arab hands in that time. They suspected some people, they went to the borders inside Israel and they followed the dogs or something and they found out this village. And they put explosive around houses. They destroyed houses, killing 53 people in that night. The people were still in the house? Yeah. And I think the leader of that attack, when they uh, put the explosion, was Sharon, really.
this is the one what I it was very close for me. But many massac- massacres happened where I didn't feel it, and uh, we were young. And after that, anyway, I I left uh, early in. Just tell me what it was like living in that room with all those people um, for five years. What did I, you do during the daytime? We are lucky. We are from the lucky people to have that place, I tell you. Because many of our villages, they settle under trees, just under trees, sleeps there, and uh, eating there, and cooking there, cooking there, what you, you know, there's no gas, nothing, just they put three stones and they put wood and make fire, and they put the pot, and that's all. And one kind of food anyway, if any, and without meat, but without anything. And very cold in the winter. Yeah, in winter, I'm not sure how long they stay there to see, to, 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 to be uh, exactly honest, but it was summertime when we left our village. Now, many, uh, even including my sister-in-law, was born under that tree. My wife's sister, she was born under that tree because there is no space. After that, uh, UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Work Agency, took over and it helped plenty, not to make us rich, not to make us healthy, just to keep us alive, just to keep us uh, out of starvation, really. Just what about the children? Was the school for the children? The children with the school, I myself, I, uh, I think um, I lost half a year, really, because uh, just the way, where we lived in the village, we registered in the school and we went back to the school. Uh, this is, was government school, but many schools in the camps where the camps were, we have plenty of camps in near Ramallah, near Nablus, near Hebron. These uh, schools, they were under UNRWA too, under the United, United Nations uh, Relief and Work Agency. Uh, teachers were employed by them. They helped really, UNRWA, they're giving milk to the children and sometimes they give them meal in the school and so on. So. Uh, the the only way it kept really Palestinians alive really otherwise probably maybe three quarters will will die from starvation, and they make gave them yeah, tents as you said in winter, they gave them tents they built for them very small, very small uh, huts, with concrete very very simple ones in the camps so they established camps. They established the schools for them, and every month they come to give us the minimum food for us, say, uh, flour, uh, I think 10 kilograms for each, sugar, uh, 500 grams for each, and uh, something which is very uh, important to, to live on. Was there despair that people felt that they were going to spend the rest of their lives living like this? What did the people think was going to happen to them? What happened uh, really uh, like tail. We went out, they told us after seven days you come back to your village. The seven days gone, then after seven months you will come back to the village. After, after seven months gone, after seven days you come back. Now it is about uh, 63 years uh, ago. We still there. Probably no one can do anything because Israel itself, the spoiled child of the world, of the United Nations, of USA, of Europe, probably Russia. I'm not sure about China really, but about Germany. They are the spoiled child of the world. So they are biased for them and they are supporting them against anything, you see. So if you look even uh, the United Nations resolution, many of them for us, but not of them was enforced. None of them. Uh, if I mention even one, the, li- the last one, which was the separation wall, is about seven years ago. 2002, the International uh, 
Court of Justice, they voted that this is illegal, should be dismantled, and stopped any building of it. When it was put uh, uh, for the uh, United Nations, uh, USA, Australia, Israel, and three microstates in the Pacific voted against this. Imagine what is it. It is separation wall, it is apartheid wall, which separates two nations, not only two nations, it took our land. They are clever. They said, oh, we want to stop terrorists, terrorists from attacking Israel. But it is not like that. They want to grab more land. They want to make like temporary borders for them because Israel it's the only country in the world that has no borders yet. It's open, open. How much they take, it is theirs. So, and this is, uh, Israel are using this uh, sympathy of the West, uh, and especially USA, very widely they are using these things. Unfortunately, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, which was at least two superpower Polar, really, in the world, which was uh, affecting uh, any decisions in the Security Council and so on. But I could say stupid Russians who, who allowed the communist system to collapse or the Soviet Union to collapse, really. In the future, no one knows. If the world is still like that, I don't know what happens. Once I said to my mate, he's a uh, half uh, French Jew, uh, one day we will win. He said, how? I said, when uh, the power balance in the world change, when China will take over. He told me, Abdul, you are stupid. Because who told you China will be you? It is already <laughs> controlled by them. <laughs> you see? Today, part two of my interview with Palestinian Australian Abdul Ramahi. Age 10, he and his family, like hundreds of thousands of others, were forced from their family home and village when the State of Israel was declared in May 1948. They eventually settled in a new village near Ramallah. In our original village, I finished three grades, grade one, two, three. When I went to the new village where we settled near Ramallah, I finished preparatory, which means year seven, eight and nine. And the way I went to Ramallah, which is the closest city to us, and I uh, studied there year 10 and 11, because in the village they have only year 9. When I finished, I found a job like teacher, because in that time, you know, this is 1957, not many people educated, so I became teacher. I worked teacher in other village. I was a uh, communist in that time. I became communist very early in my life. Really. Tell me how that happened. I, I tell you, I became communist probably when I was 14 years old. When you see the things going from worse to worse, no nationalism helps, no religion helps, nothing helps. So I revolt, really. I, I rebel against all these systems, and I became communist. But to be communist, you have to be underground. But how did you know about the party or whatever? Uh, I, I was influenced by one teacher of our in the village when he taught us the year eight and nine. And uh, my older brother, he was orientated, uh, left-wing orientated. I'm not sure if he was a member of the Communist Party or not. He was not educated too. He learned and uh, studied about uh, grade three in his life or grade four, I'm not sure, just he can read. But he was uh, old, older than me, about 25 years older than me, but uh, also still I am affected by him. So when I was teacher, uh, intelligence uh, detectives and they are asking many things from the school and so on, they found out I am communist. They called me to the police station, interrogated me, and uh, they told me, OK. I told them, proof. I have, uh, there's no proof that I have anything. I have uh, no pamphlets or something or books. So they didn't find anything with me. And how old are you then? I was uh, 19 at that time. If not, OK, you have to declare your allegiance to King Hussein. 
Oh, we go, go back a little bit. When Israel was established 1948, Jordan took the rest of Palestine. Egypt took Gaza under its control. So officially, Palestine disappeared. There is no thing called Palestine. Even I went to Russia 1963. I forgot that I am Palestinian. I am communist. And you know, communist, Jordanian communist, and the Communist Party of Jordan. There was nothing called Palestine. Or when I said, no, I am not going to... Ah, it, they asked me to th two things, uh, the police uh, or detectives. I have to denounce the Communist Party. I said, I'm not going to denounce it because I am not a member. So if, if I denounce it, this, this means I am a member. They asked me, okay, you have to uh, de declare or announce, announce uh, allegiance, what they call it, for the king. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> so I'm not sure how much I was hard, but I said, no, I'm, uh, King Hussein, he doesn't need my allegiance. Well, why should they do it anyway? So, okay, I was uh, in prison really two months. Were you mistreated? I wasn't really mistreated because, but I, they show me how they this, uh, mistreated the others really when I went in. They brought me a man from inside uh, who was so his face everywhere, his eyes closed, and from they want to scare me. But because they couldn't find anything except I am, I'm, I'm not going to make this allegiance really. And I stayed two months there, and um, after that, uh, you know, th these systems are playing with money, really. My family bribed uh, the men, uh, the uh, chairman of the detectives, and I went out. Went out, no work. I'm not allowed to work, any government work. So you're blacklisted? Blacklisted, not with the owner of what to. I have to make uh, what police uh, signing in the police station every day and it was five kilometers away from my village where I live so I have to walk go five kilometers come back five kilometers sometimes that comes from the city coming behind me I go with it if not I have to go five five and a half and five and a half kilometers and I made it for one year really Thankfully, this is good, make me fit a little bit because... <laughs> I was going to say that, it would make you fit. Yeah. So you decided that's enough. Yeah, and uh, just we finished that one. Okay, I'm not, uh, I'm not allowed to work, any, anything really. So, so who was supporting you? Very little I have support really. I have uh, my brother in uh, Kuwait was working. He was sending not the money for me, he was sending it for my mom, but my mom giving part of, uh, of it for me, really. My comrades in the Communist Party arranged, they told me they find a job for me in Jordan, in Amman. And I went there, really. I worked there as a typist and secretary for a, a medicine uh, store. And uh, his owner was communist, very good one. He, his origin uh, from uh, Nasser, right? Nasser, from Nasser, from uh, where is Israel now, really. So they left you alone there, the Who? security? The security? They, they didn't follow you? The security there, they didn't know anything about me there. They came to my brothers, they have a shop there in Jordan, they told them where he lives and so on, they didn't know where I am. Anyway, I was not working, actually, as, uh, as I said. I was working with very small money. I was undercover working for, I'm not sure if I have to say it now or not, it's a long time ago anyway, undercover for a secret communist house, which means these people, I lived with them, I sleep with them, I eat with them. And they are typing these pamphlets for the party. And I go to work this in that store. When I go home, I buy shopping for them because they, are, they cannot go making shopping. They buy tomatoes, bread, meat, anything. I just, I, uh, as I was the public face for them, but no one knows me too. So I lived about two years uh, this way. 
it was with new names really because if in that time uh, find out they probably I will uh, die under torture I'm not sure if I can stand again uh, to 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 deny where I am or who I am I don't know when when you are under torture you don't know what will happen anyway the matter is we were distributing this pamphlets underground communist members they were underground so we were printing printing plenty things really i didn't distribute them because other staff were responsible for that people i lived with i don't know them at all not their names not who are but after probably five years i knew one of them who was vi- coming visitor to the house he was secretary of the communist party His name uh, Fehmi Salfiti. I saw him in Moscow, really. I didn't know before who is he, but when he came to Moscow, he, his son was studying there too. We went there as scholarship, scholarship from uh, the Soviet Union, really. No one paid for us, not the Communist Party, not anybody, only the Soviet Union who paid it to us. They sent, sent me there. They told me to go say, to the, uh, the, Russia, the Soviet Union uh, embassy in Beirut. In Beirut, they give you a ticket, they gave me a ticket, and they directed me to, uh, to go there in Moscow. How old were you then? I was in that time about 25, or less a little bit, 25 years. I went there, I don't know any Russian word. <laughs> I know a little bit English because we studied in school, but Even I finished the school about 17, 18 years, I already started to forget, really. But it helped, because many people, they, they know a little bit English. You can communicate very, very little with them, really. And what was the scholarship for? The scholarship to study there. To This study? main thing. Now, it depends on the person who goes. If you want to be a doctor, you could. There's no score to tell you what is it. But you have to be yourself, know yourself. They teach you first year is only language. And this language depends on your specialty. I wanted to be engineer. They, they taught me, say, math, uh, terminology, say, physics, chemistry, t- terminology. If I wanted to be doctor, they, te- they teach you the medicine, uh, terminology, and weight, and so on. Ask me why I studied engineering. I studied uh, chemical engineering, uh, specializing in uh, oil and uh, gas and oil uh, processing, because our country, all it was oil. So I thought when I go and I come back, I I take a place of American uh, expert who are saying they are experts and. Uh, I didn't come back to Jordan for seven years because in that time there was no relationship, diplomatic relationship between, between Jordan and the Soviet Union. In Moscow we were about 40 people, but we say we are com- from the communist, the Jordanian Communist Party, so Palestinian has disappeared in that time. Then 1965, When Yasser Arafat, I was in, in Russia because I went 1963 until 1970, I was there, seven years. 1965, when he started Arafat, his uprising or his revolution or his Fatah organization, then became the word Palestine again. And even after that, they started, uh, the PLO started to send students scholarship to Moscow too. So in that time, we became mostly sympathizers with them because our origin is Palestine and like them. But they tried to to brainwash us that uh, there is no Palestine, I have passport Jordanian, I am uh, Jordanian and, and so on, but it is it will never work really uh, until now. Really. I'm not convinced ever. Because we forced, we were forced to take the Jordanian citizenship, really. And what did you think of Arafat? What did you think about the man and what he did or what he didn't do for the Palestinian people? Oh, well, Arafat started probably revolutionary, truly, which I believe. 
if I was in the Middle East, I will be with them, actually, because this is expression of our nationalist feeling. I was in Russia, so I, uh, and I didn't come back, so I uh, didn't belong to them. Ideologically, maybe I was very much affected with them, too, you see, because they revive a thing called Palestine which is true. And they started to be revolutionary and affected many, many revolutionary streams in the world, actually, yes, Arafat and his movement. But later, it started some corruption in the system. They were in Lebanon. I think uh, they disused the, or they abused their power there. Uh, they distant people from them. You know, when you are a revolutionary, you should be ideal, that people come to you, support you, either Lebanese, either Syrians, either Jordanians, anybody. Probably they make big, big mistakes there. And when 1982, Israeli attacked Lebanon, uh, probably many people, they were happy to, uh, to, to accept Israelis because they want to liber they thought they were liberating them from Palestinians. But the true story happened opposite to that. Israelis, they came there, make, they abused all, everything in Lebanon anyway. And the worst is the massacre, which you probably know in uh, Sabra and Shatila, which was killed about three, 4,000 Palestinians. Until now, no one opened any investigation in that massacre. Who done it? who opened the road for them. This area was surrounded by Israeli army and uh, Sharon was there. And probably he didn't want to blame the Jews in the future. He opened this to the Maronite Christians to do the job for him. And this is a shame for him and the Maronite too, because th whom they killed? They killed women, old people, children, because the men, who was in the BLO, they went to Tunisia. In that time, they were in Tunis. So when they went to these two camps, no one to defend it, actually. Only they were old ladies, old men, pregnant ladies, and children, and they killed the Yali. This w went on for days. It is just a day, a day yeah. it is 24 hours, I think, 48 hours, I'm not sure, really. Uh, this is uh, showing how much they are brutal, inhumane, in really. And the world, actually, I'm not sure why they're closing their eyes on such crimes. Say, if you go to Israel and kill one person, all the world jump up and down. But the 3,000, 4,000 people, it doesn't worth even to do investigation, you see. And until now, I don't know what happens in the future. When did you leave the Soviet Union? I finished there in 1970. And what did you find when you went back? When I came back, I tell you, I came back to Jordan. When I was uh, landed the plane, just I, 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 I was, I have hist hysteria. You know hysteria? Like, why I came back? This bloody hell. It is uh, just like I want to, 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 to have heart attack because I cannot come back to Russia too. As I said, I went back, I, I thought that I will be a replacing American expert or uh, professional or skilled people and so on. I found the things worse than seven years ago. I found everything under control of these people who are coming with uh, skilled uh, professionals, or they call this expert, expert, and so they are the same and more and more even, you see. Political situation, I found it worse and worse too. So this is what was killing. Worse in what way? Politically, they are still pro the West. They are still pro uh, against their people. They still uh, imprison any person without a trial, torture, and so on. They still uh, expel any person from his uh, work. And, you know, it, his work is there, not as here. Uh, they could expel me here, it's not matter. 
But I go to the center link. I find some th something to feed my family, to my children. But there are none. You lose your employment. You here you judge on your family for starvation just because no one will feed them. You see. So this is why they are blackmailing people there. The only income from their employment. And if you sack a person from his employment, you 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 judging on these people just uh, to, to for salvation. And this is what I say. It is nothing uh, good. Uh, the our armies really all Arab armies. All our armies are not armies against to. To, def to defend our countries, say from whom? From Israel, our enemy there is Israel. These armies, they are just to kill their people, attack their people. Say about six, two weeks ago, I think, Saudi Arabia report about 60 billion fighters from, uh, from America. What for? This is scrap. This is, has no technology. These planes, they cannot stand for anything against Israel. They buy it to attack their people, other Arab countries, and against Iran, which Iran, until now, really, I cannot say it is, it is dangerous for any Arab countries. America is playing very dirty tricks in the Middle East. They make uh, conspiracies, uh, whispers, and uh, this is Shiite, this is Sunni, this is that, that, that. It is not like that. They have their interests there in the Middle East, and they want to achieve their interests. And they forget, they forgot that we have interests too. Really, how you can say you are going to the Middle East to, to look after your interests? But we have, we are the indig indigenous people there, who lives there. We have our interests too. And this is where the equation is not, is not straight. American soldiers, uh, they come with 150,000, in Iraq about 200,000, and say even in Vietnam before, they sent half a million soldiers. They want their interests. But what about these people? What they, are the, what they are going to do? At least they want to defend themselves. If they defend themselves, they are terrorists. But you see, everything it has so many definitions these days. You see, in Vietnam they say insurgents. Insurgents. What is insurgent? He, you are coming from 20,000, 30,000 kilometers to attack this country and anybody stand against you to say he is terrorist or insurgent, it is anti-logic. It is not logic at all, really, you see. Now to the third and final part of my interview with Palestinian-Australian Abdul Rahmahi. He and his family were among the hundreds of thousands of Palestinians forced from their homes and villages by Jewish militia following the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. After living in Jordan, studying in the Soviet Union, he applied to migrate to the US, Canada and Australia, finally settling in Australia. I asked Abdul, why Australia? Uh, yeah, this is a good question. When I came from the uh, Soviet Union, I applied to work in Jordan. They rejected my application. I went to Kuwait. They rejected my application. Saudi Arabia rejected my application. Do you know why? Because I, they suspect I am still communist. Because you came from the Soviet Union. Yeah. And this is the worst thing they fear there is communism in that. Applied to Algeria, Libya, Syria, Iraq, no one accepted me. So I spent it two years. I, I was going my personally because then in uh, Kuwait I have four brothers in that time, 1970. Uh, I went to Syria. I was in. Uh, I lived in a public hotel. It is not high class, just normal. I lived there six weeks, six months, because I was. Uh, uh, make application here and there, there, and because cheap life there, it was easy for me. So then one, per, one relative of me, he was engineer in Kuwait, he told me, Abdul, why you don't uh, apply to USA, Canada, and Australia? They take skilled people. So I really, I took his words uh, directly, and I applied to Canada, USA, and Australia. USA, they didn't answer at all. 
I put my resume with them, and I am from Russia and so on. Canada, they answered me, and they, I went parallel with the Australian application together. And after six months, I made the interview there. The interview went very well, even with my normal language. I didn't want any interpreter or something. The last question, it was everything going well. The last question told me, you are a chemical engineer. Uh, suppose that in Canada you cannot find this job. I said, uh, I will ask my brothers to send me some money, to, and I stay there looking for jobs until I find it. After one week, they rejected my application. After two weeks from that, believe me, because it's their parallel with Australian, it was the interviews in Beirut, actually, because we have no in Jordan uh, these embassies, and uh, went again the same questions, mostly the same questions. Truly, really they were asked about politics. They want to know your origin. Are you uh, left orientated? Are you communist? Are you even from Yasser Arafat's uh, Fatah or something? Okay, I answered, cheated them. I, I don't know anything politics. I was studying and I came back and that. And they asked me the last question. Okay, you go to Australia and uh, there's no job for you available. Uh, what what you will do? I said, look, I will work a cleaner there. Because this is what I learned from the Canadian embassy. I am ready to work a cleaner. And really, after two weeks, they answered me, come to have the visa. Yeah, but uh, they were searching on political uh, background, really, because uh, they don't want any left-wing here, they don't want communists, they don't want any revolutionary supporting any, really, revolutionary party there, too. And what did you find when you arrived here? I came here, I don't know anybody here, really. I was in, um, in the airport, I booked a ticket to come to the city. I don't know where to, where to go. And I heard the lady talking Arabic. I told her, sorry, I am um, Palestinian, came here, I don't know anybody. Okay, she told me, look, uh, her, uh, her husband is the, an Arab uh, ambassador of Lebanon. We will try to help you. Uh, when he came, uh, her husband, we were collecting the bag because I came from Sydney. I, uh, one night I slept in Sydney, so domestic. And he came and she told him my story. He said, okay, we take you to a Lebanese restaurant. And this Lebanese restaurant, he, is, uh, he has many Palestinians come there. They work there. They eat there. They like a, a social place anyway. He told me, bring the bag from the luggage from the bus. And I brought it and we came. He gave it to me, to that man. Lucky that man was... Communist. I'm not sure if you remember him. He was in Russell's Street before the old the old uh, police station down. His name is Abu Ammar. Said Abu Ammar. It was uh, 1970, but he sold it since. He has factory suites and uh, nuts factory in Brunswick now. So we, they gave me lunch and so on, and there's one uh, was there working. Okay, ch- chaps, they came, these uh, Palestinians, go to find their room. And we went to Carlton, and uh, the rooms on the window, room for rent, room for rent, and it was cheap too, $10 a week. <laughs> so I, I lived there. But it was very difficult life at the beginning. You are homesick, you have the, don't know many. The Palestinians whom I know, few ones, and most of them married, and uh, so on. So I go to the city, run up and down, up and down, all these parallel streets, parallel streets. And when I get tired, I go home. I am very tired, but I eat my food, then I, it is very bored and homesick, uh, and I go back to the city. And uh, I lived with Albanese people, they told me, they noticed uh, how, how I feel, they told me, uh, look, Abdul, there is a place called People in Touch. It was for the immigration department, I think, think in that time, on uh, Elizabeth Street near the market. And go there and ask, uh, they do, they have activities and so on. And really, I went, they do dancing every Saturday. And uh, young people, all of them migrants, some of them little bit English and so on. Really, it was okay. Then I studied English here for a couple of uh, months. You go there two hours. Then uh, I took a course, uh, English intensive course. Uh, this was for two months from nine to five, which was good. And then uh, I improved. Uh, I knew much and knew friends and so on. So it was the life became good, really.
At a job? Were you a cleaner? Uh, the job? <laughs> cleaner. It was similar to that, anyway. I went to uh, the uh, employment office. I was uh, dealing with two employment offices. One was a professional employment office. I'm not sure if you remember these two green, uh, two green buildings were high near the Federation, the Federation uh, Square now. The gas and fuel buildings. Yes, that you are right. And one of them was, it has the uh, professional build, uh, employment office. And the other one, it was on Flinders Street, just normal uh, office where... Employment. So they gave me two tickets for the bus. Go there, they have, uh, they employ you. I went uh, to Toyota and it was uh, wielding. I didn't like it. Oh, and holding there, I didn't like it too. So I was walking alone and to look for jobs on myself because in that time, easy to find vacants available, vacants available. I went to a factory. And they do manual thing, everything manual. They were making a sink, molding sinks for the toilets. Uh, this beer barrel, which they send it to the hotels. And when they send it back from the factory, they are damaged a little bit here and here. And we filled it with water under pressure from this side and this side. And we have the hammer and kicking it until it is good. After that, I went to the tires factory in... Uh, South Melbourne, and there I worked two, one week. I applied for skilled work because my friend, is Egyptian, told me, Abdul, if you, this is hard, this is bad, and this one, and you indicated, apply. If it is not a skilled work, half a skilled work. So I applied for a laboratory technician. In that time, laboratory assistant it was. And really, I went, and they told me, start tomorrow. I said, okay, tomorrow, no. After, after one week, I had to give notice. This is, I worked in this tire uh, factory only one week. And it was tired, for, tired it was dusty, it was heat. You, you grab these tires after molding and very bad. But lucky, I, I worked there only two weeks and started my job. And this job, what I started, I stayed for 35 years. <laughs> 35 years during that time, you became married. You became a political activist here in Australia. What was happening? I came here. It was a difficult uh, financial problem, really, because I borrowed money when I came here for the tickets and so on. I had to help my mum and sisters there. So I was getting, at the beginning, $59 a week. Then when I went to this last job, it was $82, which was a very big jump, really. So I stayed there working, and uh, one friend of mine, he was communist, he told me, Abdul, don't get married now, because if you get married, you never buy anything, buy a flat or something. It's better for you to buy a flat, and then you go to get married. So I heard his words. I bought a unit for 25000 in uh, Spotswood, near Williamstown. Really, I lived one year, then I went uh, overseas. I was engaged. After four months, uh, my fiancée came after me. From where? From West Bank. She was living in Jalazon Camp. It is Jalazon Camp. It is under the UNRWA organization. And they said, imagine, from 1948 until... Until really, until now, you can say they are living there. But 1979, my wife came from there, near Ramallah, five kilometers north of Ramallah. Was that difficult for her to leave? To leave, um, I don't know, probably she was happy <laughs> to get rid out of there once and uh, to find a husband too. I was old, really. I was uh, about 41 years old. She was uh, 19. She was very young, really. Luckily, she's still with me anyway. About politics here, we tried to do maximum, but in that time I was working shift. So at one stage, I cut off my activity, political activity, really. Uh, because shift, I worked seven day shift, seven afternoon shift, seven night shift. It was very terrible, really, in that time, but the money was good. I want to say about the situation now, really. Yes, Arafat and his, uh, the BLO, uh, they make secret talks and agreement with the Israelis. Ended in 1994, 
that they will come back from exile. They were living in Tunisia. They were naive and believed that Israel changed its attitude, changed their human uh, relations or uh, something. And they came on promises, big promises. Oh, we will have Palestinian state in five years. We will have Jerusalem, our capital. All the refugees will come back to Palestine and so on. Really, in that time, it was coming worse and worse and worse. Settlements, they were growing so quick that they built from that time until 2007, not now even, about 200 settlements with population between 400,000 to 500,000. Where is it? In our land, in our West Bank. West Bank is small one for us even. And they planted these settlements around our village and cities, uh, sitting on high sports mountain to control. I say about, about Jarazon camp, really. They at night, they put this uh, high light beam that it goes through the rooms. If they have this is a binocular, they see every person inside the room even, you see. Ramallah the same. They have around it many settlements. Jerusalem, oh, don't talk about Jerusalem. It is like from East Jerusalem to, <laughs> can call it a, a Jewish uh, a place, really. Now they say two-state solution to a liberal way. Two-state solution means we are in enclaves. Palestinians live in enclaves, in ghettos, uh, checkpoints everywhere. It is impossible to have anything to develop a state there, really. And Gaza is even a worse prison. In Gaza, what happened? Gaza, when they missed this uh, engagement, there because they have not much there. They have 8,000 uh, settlers there, so it cost them much money and army and there. Run away. And he said, what they done? They done it as a jail from all the sides, but without ceiling. One and a half million, you put them in a space, closed from everywhere, from the sea, from the land, from the air, because there is no planes coming. And even they forced Egypt to close the border too, which is Egypt's Arab country. It has good history before when Jamal Abdel Nasser, Jamal Abdel Nasser was. They forced them, blackmailing, because everything is there for money. Egypt, they are a poor country. They cannot feed their people. America gave them, I'm not sure, one billion dollars a year, mostly wheat and so on. This is the people how they live. If America cut this wheat, probably they will start to death. So they blackmail everybody. Jordan, it has no budget. All of its budget coming from USA. So they control them as they want. Yasser Arafat, he came back. He thought that he has dreams in his uh, mind, but he was stupid and became worse and worse. I said about my village. Now I'll talk about my village again. My village, I saw it 1991. Because when we go, we hire a car which has Israeli registration plate, and we go freely because I'm Australian. We go, I have a video, also I videoed it. Of course, before even 1970, 1972, and 1991, it was just flat. Now, I went uh, 2000, just before the Intifada by one week. I was lucky to go there before one week. I went there with my brother-in-law, because he lives in Jerusalem, he has a gestation, Israeli. And I, I took my camera with me too, video camera. You go there, it is the most modern city, better than Ramallah, the, which we say Ramallah is a good city in West Bank. They put uh, this balm uh, tree like it is, it is 100 years old even, and the sea's two sides, Houses as six, seven story. Probably population there maybe up to twenty thousand people. And I went. We went through it. No one asked us anything really. I have my two daughters and my uh, brother-in-law and his son. I think he was with us. You can ask me why they build now. They build now. I think I asked when they started to build. They told me nineteen ninety-seven. When they found Yasser Arafat, he has nothing, not the power, not the resistance. He lost all his 
what he called the revolutionary before. So who will ask about this land? My village, it should be, according to the United Nations partition 1947, with the Arabs. But really, we, it was under Israeli demilitarization zone, really. So we cannot stay there, you cannot go there, you're just a military zone. So when they saw Yasser Arafat is stupid, when they say these Arab leaders are a bit for the Americans and for, for them, so they started to build. And they built plenty, plenty. And if you go there, yeah, it's difficult to say unless you see. Probably, I'm not sure if you saw some information. If it was, uh, for us, it was 90%. Then in uh, 1947, they gave us 45%. And then 1967, they took, they attacked us and they took the, took the lot. They occupied West Bank, Gaza, Sinai, even from Egypt, Sinai Peninsula from Egypt, Golan Heights. So really, they took the lot. After each time, United Nations resolution came to withdraw these forces immediately. It was denied and this was never implemented. The partition is the same. If you go back to, from 1967 to 2000, they built all these settlements inside these dots everywhere, everywhere in West Bank and Gaza. It is occupied. This one, it is against international law because when you are a Cubaya, you have to look for the people who, are, who you control. You shouldn't uh, confiscate land by force. You shouldn't transfer your uh, citizen people, the Israelis, to this land to live there, and so on. After that, 2002, when they started to build this uh, separation, wall, not only the separation wall, the matter is they build highways for the settlements alone. This goes from our land. They take our land, our cars, our people, they cannot do it. They are facilitating the a transport between the Israeli settlements in the West Bank to Israel, proper Israel, you see. And if you look at the map, you see it now, we are dots, enclaves, ghettos, we tell them, okay, come on, we will make one state solution. Said, no. Yeah. Why? Because you will be, <laughs> in the future, you will, your population will be more than us. Israel will finish. Very difficult, really. Uh, no one knows what will happen. It looks like a joke. When I was working in the laboratory, one Indian was uh, like uh, bookkeeper, secretary. And he reads, he was every day, reads the newspaper, and we read the newspaper. And he come to me, Abdul, what is the problem bloody in this Palestine? Every day, killing, they kill you, you kill them, they kill you for years and years and years. What, what, what is happening there? His name, I think, Dean, yeah. I think, Dean, look, it is very complicated there. People, they came from Germany, from Poland, from Russia, from America. Later, they came from Ethiopia, and they took our land, and they kicked us out. Oh, I said, it is not a big problem, Abdul. I would, I would solve it in one week. I said, you are bloody funny. I said, no, it's not funny. I go there. Believe me. I said, what you will do there? I go in the street. I ask, hello, uh, Khawaja, or uh, hello, we say Khawaja, who is uh, a Jew. Hello, mate. Uh, how are you? From where did you come? Uh, I came from Russia. Okay. Look, I give you one week. Collect your luggage. And after one week, go to Russia. Okay, I go to the other lady. Hello, lady, how are you? From where did you come? From Poland. Ah, very good. You know what happened? Just collect your luggage and go to Poland. And that one from uh, Germany, the same. And that from USA, the same. Abdul, it is easy. Palestine is yours then. <laughs> and this is nice. One more thing you'd like to say? Yeah, I could say this one. It was about a couple of months ago. ex coupon president Castro, I quote his words. He said, 
Israel is treating Palestinian people much worse than what the Nazi Germany done in the Holocaust. The Zionist Israel had so hated against Palestinian people to the extent they will burn the entire Palestinian people. Anyway, just at the end, really, I have to thank you very much because you are helping us to raise the awareness of Australians uh, to know our case. Believe me, when I go to a demonstration, I feel my heart is so open, so happy when I see honest Australian coming with us, supporting us. Some of them Jews. Believe me, let us say the truth. Many uh, intellectual uh, Jews are uh, supporting us, not even in Australia. Some of them in, uh, in America, some of them in England, some of them in Israel itself. Israel itself, some of them, they support us, intellectual people, peace, peace activists. And I met here a soldier who was in Israeli army. She came here and she destroyed her passport and she is living in Sydney. I met her here and she said, I feel my government is committing war crimes and it will not be in my name. And she destroyed her passport. And uh, thank you very much, Jane, for, for this opportunity. It was fine, really, to express a little bit what, what is in my heart, really. But Palestine will be never forgotten. It is our hearts. It is our soul. I wish one day, maybe it will not be in, in our days, uh, maybe it will take plenty of time, they say the Jews, they waited 1,300 years to come back. Small part, they were there. And their kingdom, as they say, it was there. It was very short, was 70 years old only. And in that time, even Canaanite, they called them there. They were lived with Arabs, with everybody. And I hope we will not stay 1,300 years to come back, really. If they are intelligent enough, they are our cousins. You know that or not? The Jews are cousins for the Arabs. Our granddad is the same, Abraham. They have one son of Abraham and we are the other. So they are stupid, they are fighting for nothing. We could live together and we be friendly. The, the economy will, uh, will um, uh, pros prosperous will be in all the world and in the Middle East. But they are stupid uh, really because they cannot accept the fact that we all exist. We are eight million now, or seven million. There are seven million there. So uh, what, do you want to kill us all to, to stay there? It is impossible. And we are not thinking to kill them because we are recognizing Palestine is a holy land. It is not for Muslims. It is for Muslims, Christians, and Jews. The war there is not a religious one. It is economical one. It is imperialist one. It is colonization only.